Hubhopper Originals. To start your podcast for free, log on to studio.hubhopper.com. Hello everyone and welcome back to Indian Genes. On our episode today, we have a very special guest and the conversation is going to be very exciting, informative and of course enjoyable as well. Our guest today is a space engineer and currently working with the Berlin Space Technologies in Germany and is building onboard data handling systems for Earth observation microsatellite platforms. During a previous stint at the German Aerospace Center in Berlin, she had worked on the MMX or Martian Moons Exploration Sample Return Mission and developed FPGA software for a rover instrument. Before her move to Germany, she was a research engineer at the Advanced Data Processing Research Institute, one of the research centers under the Department of Space for the Government of India. Her work was primarily development of novel ground processing chain architectures for high resolution LEO and also GEO satellites for the Indian Space Research Organization ISRO. She is also an active member of the Women in Aerospace Network and co-led the creation of its Berlin local group and is currently spearheading its activities. She has a master's degree in space engineering from Technical University Berlin, Germany and has a second master's degree in space and telecommunication laws from the National Academy of Legal Studies and Research here in India. This was a very interesting conversation for me, very informative and I have to say enjoyable as well. We spoke about everything from satellites to space exploration, laws that are required for space debris. We've got some amazing book recommendations as well. We touch on sci-fi, aliens, the future of space exploration, the mind itself. So sit back and relax. I now present my very interesting conversation with none other than Rachna Reddy. Rachna, a very big welcome to you from everyone here at Indian Genes. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. I must say an honor as well. We have been looking out for someone very similar to what you are doing in the space field. So thank you so much for spending your time to talk to us here. Thank you very much for having me, Hawkeye. I'm super thrilled to be on Indian Genes. It's a lovely, fantastic podcast. Great efforts, and it's also quite fun to be on the. on a podcast as a guest so <laughs> i am a little nervous about it but yeah i'm really excited as well let's see how it goes yeah that's interesting because you're on the other end and before we even get further would you want to tell our listeners about what you do as far as your podcast is concerned and who you've been connecting with yeah absolutely yes so um, i run this podcast called those space people the biggest reason i started this podcast is Uh, after you know uh, kind of midway during the covid pandemic i really missed out on attending events and conferences and meeting people and so i thought uh, and then i tried attending a lot of online conferences but then it's not really the same you know you don't get this personal connect when you're doing it online or as part of a large group online uh then i thought maybe um because the biggest thing that i really missed out about uh, events and conferences is these short coffee break conversations you have you know one to one really quick conversations sometimes 5 minutes sometimes it stretches into like half an hour or like an hour that's really interesting right. so the exact same format uh yeah so the exact same format i took it and then i thought ha huh, let's do it online on a one to one basis and then maybe publish this as a as a podcast because i'm pretty sure it's quite interesting so that's one reason and secondly the more i thought about this and the more i did it i realized that most people outside of the space industry or who are you know trying to find their way around the space industry they mostly hear about people uh, at the very top like astronauts or ceos or you know the ones at the very top and they rarely get to hear all these voices uh, you know all across this hierarchy and so i really wanted to bring their voices out and show to people that you can operate at different levels in the space industry and do awesome things on an everyday basis like i do as a space engineer so i really wanted to share it with people um and i tried to have as many people from diverse backgrounds as possible so i have an architect who builds these space habitats uh, does research for these space habitats there is somebody with a phd in psychology who is heading business development at a company 
and there is a space archaeologist and there's an astronomer and different kinds of somebody with an economics and uh, international studies background who's working with a VC firm. So all these people. So the thing is, I try to focus on the, the ones who've had some experience in the space industry, but not who are at the very top. I like to focus on people who haven't been on too many podcasts before, <laughs> because right. if they've already been talking too much, right? So their, um, their narrative is quite set. So I want, I try to have people who've never been on a podcast make them comfortable and lead the conversation. So they have a very fresh perspective on things. Right. And that's amazing because I've been listening to your podcast and following it. I have to say for everybody listening as well, they have definitely have to check your podcast out. And like you said, you've got this fresh new perspective that you're going to be bringing into questions that we may have on space. And as most of our listeners are university kids, they're going to want to know where do you start rather than where do you end? Because at the end, uh, you would be as successful as the amount of hard work or dedication you put in. We currently may not have that guidance. We have the the successful uh, entrepreneur at the top. So we are really looking forward to this conversation where you can break down a lot of this for us. And maybe you could start with your journey, uh, uh, Rachana, as to what you are doing professionally and how you got to do what you're doing. Yeah, so Hokim, this is a, a really fantastic coincidence because I, first of all, I keep getting this question all the time from students, you know, everywhere on social media, on LinkedIn, everywhere. How do you find opportunities, you know, how to start? And just yesterday, I started writing an article. So on my, <laughs> on my way back home from work, I, I got some spare time on the train and then I started an article exactly about this. Uh, because I usually write articles on my website answering these kind of questions because it's because I get these questions so many times, you know, and then uh, and then I write an article and, and I just share the link. So that's easier. Maybe this time I will share this podcast. So <laughs> that's cool. Um, so about me, I've, uh, I, I should say I, I am quite privileged, actually, uh, because I come from a family of engineers. And then my I think my brain has quite uh, has been quite wired to think from an engineer's perspective from the very beginning. So, um, so in that way, I think I'm quite privileged. And frankly speaking, being an engineer is one of the easiest ways to find opportunities in the space industry. So, uh, but maybe I'll tell you briefly about how I started. So space really started for me because of, um, of, a, comp of a competition that I participated in, in my 10th grade. So NASA organizes these space settlement design competitions for high school kids. And then I had the opportunity to participate in one of these. And my team, um, we went up to the international finals. Uh, and this finals was happening in Houston. So the whole format of this competition is a bunch of kids. You know, your team has to come together, build a space settlement, do the design aspects, do, you know, figure out how, how you're going to automate it, how you're going to run the operations, everything else. And they divide you into teams and they pair you with an international team. And that's when I got my huge exposure. Uh, and then I realized, wow, there is, there is a world outside my little bubble and these guys do space stuff. And that's how I got introduced. And then, you know, the, once the space bug bites you, there's no going <laughs> back. <laughs> so, and then, yeah, and then I um, oriented all my education towards that. And after my, so we have this two year, uh, um, I don't know what you call it, uh, intermediate from where I come from or pre-university or however they call it. Um, I did it in physics, chemistry and math. And then uh, there is this university called Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology. It's uh, an institute by the Department of Space. So basically it was started right uh, just one year before I was due to pick my undergrad. And uh, the requirement of this is was also quite stringent. So. I think they had very few seats and you had to qualify into the JE and like a lot of things, but then they didn't really have a very permanent campus and it was very, very uh, not really known amongst anybody. And, but I took the big chance and then went to this university and uh, we had a lot of, the best thing about IIST was it wasn't, it doesn't give you the campus feels, you know, it's not like a university and like mm -hmm. so many people, it, mm -hmm. it's more like a research lab <laughs> and it's really research lab. And we had a lot of engineers from ISRO and uh, because we had the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center and other ISRO centers. This was in Trivandrum, by the way, in Kerala. So we had all these people coming to us and teaching classes. And it's so exciting when you're 
when your lecturer or your professor says, hey, you know, let's talk about this engine today. And by the way, I built this part of it. So that's wow. super cool. Yeah, so that was really exciting. And then we had a lot of courses on astronomy and everything else. And my stream was uh, electronics. Uh, so they called it avionics, but it's more of an electronics and commu it's equivalent to the ECE degree, you know, the electronics and communications engineering. And then uh, after studying here, we have this bond. So because our complete education, everything, food and everything uh, was completely sponsored by the Department of Space, we had to serve in ISRO as an employee, as a regular employee, of course, for five years. So I chose my um, center in, uh, in Hyderabad, in my hometown. It was doing really exciting stuff on FPGAs. So I chose that and I worked on it for about five years. And we were working on the ground segment part of it, you know, the ground segment chain of satellite processing, uh, of satellite data processing. And then after five, and then actually three years into this, I wanted to get a, a different perspective on space because I realized I've just been an engineer for too long. And then I started, and about that time, so it was in 2014 or so, uh, at least I got introduced to a few space events that were happening in India. And back then it was very, very few events. You know, there was this ORF uh, in Delhi and a couple of space ops and, you know, very few events, not, not as many as they're happening right now. And then I got introduced to it. I got introduced to a lot of people from different backgrounds in space in India. Uh, and then I realized, okay, maybe it would be nice to get a different perspective because I'm looking at it purely from a technical and from an engineer's perspective. And then I found this really cool course co uh, called Master in Space and Telecommunication Laws. So it's basically a master degree, a professional master degree in space law offered by Nalsar University, fortunately in the same city that I was living in. So I signed up for it. And this course was amazing. It was, so this course was also quite new. And then we had, um, uh, so in our class of about 15, 20 people, half of us were engineers and half of us were actually practicing lawyers. So we had lawyers practicing in different high courts of the country, in Gujarat High Court, in the Madras High Court, in the Bombay High Court, oh, that's and interesting. coming to us. Yeah, right. And then it was, uh, so half the courses, half the syllabus was very engineering oriented. And of course, all of us engineers rocked it. <laughs> and then we had, <laughs> and then we had the legal aspects and then we're like, okay, oh God, we really need your help. And then the best part, <laughs> right? So, and the way, engineers and lawyers look at things very differently. And that's when I realized, wow, there are so many perspectives to looking at a problem in space, especially. Also, I think another amazing part of uh, my time uh, during, you, doing this course was we had to stay on campus. So we, though it was a professional master's and a lot of it uh, was done, um, we did not have a lot of on-site sessions. We had these two on-site sessions per semester and there were like four days at a stretch. And all these four days we were staying at the campus. And for me, that was like, you know, when you're staying on campus, you go to the canteen and then there's a lot of people talking around you. Yeah. And it was all legal jargon because all these nuls are, you know, uh, LL, the students, the law students. Mm. And it was completely different to the purely engineering background that I grew up in. And that was also like super fun. They were debating on the latest policy aspects, the law and, oh, this bill is introduced in the parliament and having very, very... Hmm. Uh, high level uh, technical discussions on legal points you know so that was uh, quite quite interesting and yeah so after that course then i then more i started attending more events in india and you know my horizons kind of broadened and i really wanted to explore more i wanted to understand different space ecosystems across the world i wanted to understand different parts of the space chain because i only worked on the ground segment I wanted to work in the space segment and you know, mingle with different cultures and so on. And then after my bond period, I uh, looked up for courses. And then I realized, uh, at least when I was looking for courses in 2017, they weren't, uh, most of the master courses in space uh, were oriented towards aerospace engineering, right? So there's a difference between aerospace and uh, let's say electronics or avionics engineering, mm. because avionics focuses on the electronics aspects of it and aerospace was more like cfd you know computational fluid dynamics or propulsion or uh, structures and these aspects which i did not have a background nor interest in so there were very few courses and uh, 
firstly, the reason I chose uh, to do a master is because being a student is the easiest way to find your uh, path or find a niche uh, or find a, uh, to get your foot in the door, basically, mm. you know, outside, outside of the country and especially in the space sector. And the reason I did not pick U.S. because U.S., uh, the United States, America is a very popular choice for Indian students. And I did not pick that because they have something called these ITAR regulations, which prevent non-citizens, non-U.S. citizens to work uh, in space related missions, be it with pri in private companies or the government, because a lot of them are, you know, ITAR protected. And you can only work on a few science missions and very uh, non non critical roles and etc. So that's why I did not pick that path. And so the obvious choice for me was Germany because TU Berlin, the technical university in Berlin was um, offering a great course, a system level course. And also TU Berlin had this heritage of building a lot of satellites. So I think uh, the first student satellite launched or the first university satellite launched by ISRO, by PSLV, was uh, the satellite from TU Berlin. So, mm -hmm. and also ISRO and the DLR, which is the German Aerospace uh, Center, had a great relationship throughout many years through research and through exchange of scientists. So Germany seemed uh, a great place. And then I took up this course and I was also, I could say, because I already had built up a little bit of my network in India by attending classes, uh, sorry, by attending events and conferences, I was able to connect with a couple of these um, heads of companies in Berlin who would attend in uh, the events in India. And so it was quite easy for me to land a student job. And yeah, so I started uh, doing a student job alongside my master, took my own sweet time of three years to finish the master's. <laughs> which is actually quite the norm in Germany. And uh, yeah, and now I'm working uh, uh, full time with this company after graduating from the master course. And meanwhile, during the master course for my uh, master thesis, I got an opportunity to do it at the German Aerospace Center. Actually, they were quite, uh, uh, quite nice. They were very, very welcoming. I worked on a sample return mission. It's called the MMX mission uh, by the German Aerospace Center. It's an international collaboration. So as a student, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to work on it. So that was also fun. And yeah, that's my journey. So just listening to you, uh, there are two things that are obvious in this journey of yours. And one is hard work and the other one is perseverance or dedication, right? Like you said, your, your mind works like an engineer. So I'm assuming you would be a very task oriented person because before you would have finished the first step, you were already thinking about the second step and what do I do next and where do I get that opportunity rather than sit back and wait for things to happen. You have gone there and made things happen for you. Is, is that the kind of person you are? And what was the culture like there? <laughs> yeah, you're very kind, Joachim. Um, I would attribute, attribute a lot of this to luck as well because I was lucky to find a lot of uh, mentors and really amazing role models through my journey. So I would just say most of it was me being at the right place at the right time. So uh, having said that, it's it's definitely true. You need a lot of perseverance, a lot of uh, forethought. Uh, I mean, a lot of looking ahead to survive or to sustain in the space industry, I would say, because it's it's not like a sprint, you know, it's it's more like it's not even a marathon surviving in the space industry. It's more like an Iron Man interspersed with a few marathons. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I used to think I was quite hardworking until I met a lot of other people who are, you know, these crazy hardworking people. And, and so. it just pushes you more, I guess, because you were just mentioning about luck. And I, and I have a very interesting uh, thought that, that I use as far as luck is concerned. And I tell people, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a secret formula to get lucky. And th that is the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yes, <laughs> I, I think so too. Yes, um, well, that's definitely true. I've, I always had to put in a lot of efforts. That's definitely true. Because luck can only take you, you know, to the gates of something. But mm. From there, it's it's your journey. That's right, very true. right. And uh, sorry, Rachna, you, we wanted to talk about the culture. And before we get there, I just want to, if you don't mind, get back to a particular point you had made earlier. I didn't want to stop you. But you had mentioned something called FPGA. Is that an acronym for something maybe? Oh, 
<laughs> Sorry, I was uh, probably just caught up in it. So FPGA is nothing. Uh, the full form is Field Programmable Gate Array. It's much simpler than it sounds. Actually, it sounds <laughs> with the okay. full form sounds quite daunting. But it's basically so we have these um, micro microprocessor chips, right? Mm -hmm. You know, which uh, all the microcontrollers or the computers, everything is built on these microprocessor chips. But inside a microprocessor chip, there is already um, how do you say the internal architecture of a microprocessor chip is already set. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is only, for example, we have these configurations called 64 bit. If you, if you look at our operating systems or, you know, the model of your computer, of your laptop and everything, it says, hey, this is Intel or Pentium, blah, blah, blah chip. And it's 64 bit or 32 bit or blah, blah, bit with so much blah, blah, blah and all these specifications. Mm. So this so uh, parameters like this, they are basically talking about the internal architecture of this microprocessor. So these microprocessors are very generic, so you can do a lot of operations on them. However, when you take an FPGA, an FPGA is also a chip where you process data, you process stuff just like a microprocessor. But the difference is the internal architecture of this FPGA is not frozen like in a microprocessor. Mm -hmm. So it is you can program it at the time of using it. So it's field programmable, you know, programmable in field. Mm -hmm. And it's an array of gates. And these gates basically allow you to, so you can write any, you can code any design, any functionality and uh, using several software tools, we compile it, we synthesize it into a bit stream, you know, basically a stream of ones and zeros, which this FPGA understands and then pour it into the FPGA. And then the FPGA, so the internal, the architecture of the FPGA. So basically the hardware gets molded according to our design. Okay. Right, so the hardware itself is programmable. And the reason why we require FPGA chips is because uh, microprocessors are great, but then they are they have a severe limit on the processing speed. You know, we have these 4 point, uh, 2.5 gigahertz or all these spe uh, speed specifications. But on an FPGA, you can even go up to 100 gigahertz of processing speed because you're actually molding the hardware as per your requirement. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so these are useful, for example, if somebody wants to do um, image processing, which is very computationally intensive. So a lot of uh, onboard computers and satellites. So FPGAs are used ubiquitously everywhere on the ground, even your like washing machines and like very uh, in, in different flavors, in different formats, these FPGAs are used. But in space, especially a lot of people, a lot of onboard computers and satellites are using these because Earlier, we used to just take snapshots of space uh, using satellites, uh, sorry, snapshots of the Earth uh, on the satellite and then beam down the entire image, right? Mm. Now the trend is people want to do some processing on board itself. So one of the reasons is, let's say 60% of the images we captured have clouds in them and they're like totally useless when we bring it to ground, right? It's so, correct. Yeah, so for various reasons, people want to do a lot of processing on board. Uh, and for this purpose, FPGAs are great. And, but uh, not, I, I don't want to go into like the super mm -hmm. details, not literally FPGAs, but uh, a variant of those. But this is broadly what right, FPGAs right. are. Right, right. No, this is really edu a real education of getting. And would that mean that because of these FPGAs, you're, you would get a wider width or your content or you would have more data to uh, play around with? No, the transmission, of course, would de depend on the transmitter and the receiver and the data link, you know, the bandwidth. It's only, it's it's just an alternative to using a microprocessor. Okay. So only the computationally, it gets enhanced. And yeah, it also has more fringe benefits. You can also use it to glue between, you know, different protocols and because you can play around so much with it. You can have like right. different subsystems yeah, on different protocols and you can use an FPGA to glue things. Right, right. And uh, before we get to what you're currently doing at the Berlin Space Technology Company, Rachna, at the moment, uh, we've been hearing so much, at least for us who are not in the field or not in the field as yet, students, about satellites and small satellites and mini satellites. And that seems to be the new buzz. Before we get into what you're currently doing at Berlin Space Technologies, would you be able to just break this whole satellite industry for us down as to where has it, where is it going or where has it come from? 
and the importance of these new CubeSats that people are talking about. Is there an easier way for you to break this down for us? Yeah, so first of all, speaking of, um, it, it's it's a huge industry, you know, it's, it's very complex. Mm. And uh, first of all, space as such, I mean, of course, you know, space is not really um, completely market driven, as in, you know, most of the funding, most of the money, everything, it still uh, originates, a lot of space activity still originates from the governments mm. across the world. So uh, space is kind of a very complex ecosystem, I would say. But anyway, speaking of the sizes of the satellites, uh, since you mentioned it first, uh, simply put nanosat nanosatellites, microsatellites, and mini satellites, these are just names. Uh, these are classifications given to satellites based on their mass, so their uh, how much they weigh. For all the satellites which are less than 10 kilograms are called these nanosatellites and the one between 10 and 100 are called uh, microsatellites and the ones higher are you know mini satellites and it's not a very very strong distinction it's not a few kilograms or a few tens of kilograms here and there would still you know push it into one of these categories yeah. so first and there's also something called pico satellites less than one kilogram wow uh, Yes, yes. But these are mostly for research or developed by students so they can get a complete experience of building the entire satellite bus, which is quite good. Uh, but practically speaking, it's mostly it has been earlier, you know, initially all these all the governments um, were mostly building these uh, one ton or two ton or three ton satellites. And these are mostly the communication satellites in the geostationary orbit. So this is about 36,000 more or less kilometers from the surface of the earth mm. and and because you know given the nature of this geostationary so from any person from any perspective on the earth they are stationary in the geostationary and so they're perfect anchors to supply to provide communication so these satellites are quite huge and the reason they're quite huge is uh, several reasons one is they carry a lot of um, fuel because they have to keep correcting their uh, uh, positions, you know, in space, they are technically stationary, but then they have to spend a lot of fuel in correcting their orbits. That's one. And secondly, they have, uh, because they are at, 30, at such a long um, distance away from receivers on Earth, they need giant transmitters. So that also adds to the mass and, you know, all this. And then it kind of builds up. And then eventually you also require a huge power system, a huge battery, you know, to survive mm. when there's no sunlight and also a huge power handling system. And, you know, that way it just turns into these huge mega um, satellites. And, but then, uh, so, so if, if it's a geostationary, you usually get uh, these, you know, many ton satellites, but then later what happened is, um, is you can only do communication from this geostationary orbit, right? And an another use we see for space is, uh, taking pictures from space, which is basically remote sensing, mm. uh, taking pictures in different bands, be it visual, thermal, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And for that, this altitude is not a really great way. It does not give you the necessary detail. So people started coming a little closer. And then what we have is this low Earth orbit, which is between roughly 300 kilometers to 200 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And this is where we have these slightly smaller satellites, maybe about 500 or few hundred, uh, less than one, less than one ton, I would say. Mm -hmm. And most popularly now we have a lot of these hundred kilograms or 500 or a few hundred kilogram satellites. And these are mostly imaging satellites. So they take, uh, you know, they, they have a, uh, they have a camera on board and they take pictures and because they're much closer to the ground station, they don't need such a huge transmitter. And, and however, their orbit life is quite small. Okay. So if it's, if a satellite is at 300 kilo, uh, kilo kilometers altitude, then it does not really survive for more than three years. That's because the density of the atmos atmosphere is quite high at this altitude. Mm. And then it, you know, it, it, uh, it brings down the lifetime of the satellite, essentially. And, and also the satellite is not carrying enough fuel to do a lot of these course corrections. And at this point, at the mass of the satellite, given the launch costs and, you know, all the economics around it, it's just easier and cheaper to replace it rather than, you know, kind of refuel it. Right. Yeah. So these are broadly the two. And now also later we, we have a lot of uh, satellites uh, for communication much closer to the earth as well. 
uh, I mean, the Russians have been doing it because they have, they were at, uh, you have these orbits called, I don't know if anyone studied space, uh, basics of space, you would see these different kinds of orbits, these weird orbits called Molnia orbits. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. So these are these highly elliptical orbits. So the problem is a lot of these orbits, uh, they are much closer to, um, if, if you're a geostationary satellite, right? So you are, you are uh, uh, mostly on the equator, uh, countries like Russia and, you know, because they they don't want their satellite to spend too much time looking at the lower latitudes because their country is completely in the higher latitudes. Mm. So they, they devise these highly elliptical, like inclined orbits. So basically the, the satellite would spend more time at higher, you know, if you visualize the globe and then draw like an ellipse, a very highly elliptical ellipse at an angle. So you would see that it would spend much more time at the higher latitudes of the globe than the lower attitudes because uh, latitudes because that's where they wanted to focus right so yeah so we have these different configurations so now the trend is basically we are moving towards you must have seen all the starlink satellites and the one web satellites they so basically these people wanted to do um satellite communication not from this crazy thirty six thousand kilometers away because it's so far away there's a lot of latencies mm. you know you can't really provide everyday broadband because you know, I'm, let's say I'm playing a first person shooting game and I would hit any kind of <laughs> lag in my game. Yeah. So broadband, um, so they thought, okay, broadband perhaps more, makes more sense from with lower latencies. And then they started coming to this low earth orbit, but this is also not something quite new. new. It's already been done in uh, uh, Iridium. I mean, uh, your listeners can probably look up Iridium. That's also one fantastic story. But the biggest problem with doing satellite communication from these lower um altitudes is um you do not get such high uh, bandwidth is one and secondly you need many s satellites in the const there has to be a constellation we can't obviously make do with one because it does not stay overhead all the time and also your ground receiver has to steer and you know to accommodate the different satellites in its view um but yeah anyways I, I don't know maybe if you want to go into such detail but starlink anyways has figured this game out mm -hmm. so now now it's a lot of focus on the low earth orbits and um and then we started having a lot of these private players because it's much easier now now a space company doesn't really have to build like three tons of kilograms of satellites now the mark there is demand and market for 100 kilogram or 500 kilogram class satellites or even smaller and then people began experimenting with smaller satellites and that's when these uh, the CubeSats came up. So the CubeSat, basically, the word CubeSat, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a standard developed by, oh God, I keep forgetting who this person is. So the reason why CubeSats are very popular is because there's already a CubeSat standard available in the industry. Mm -hmm. So a CubeSat literally means it's a cube. It's a cube of 10 centimeters, right? So if you look at the subsystems in a that's CubeSat- That's it, 10 centimeters? A 10 centimeter cube is wow. like one U. It's it's one U. Yeah. Like, so one unit. I mean, of course, one unit of CubeSat doesn't really solve. So most people try three U or, you know, when you're talking about the size of CubeSats, mm. uh, they speak in terms of U, okay. right? So they say one, three U CubeSat or a 20 U CubeSat or a 30 U CubeSat. Okay. So in different configurations. Yeah. So the reason why CubeSats are so far popular is because most of the subsystems right in this cubesat are these um it's it, it comes on a printed circuit board in a pcb and it's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters mm -hmm. right so that's and it's these are all like very stackable so that the whole idea of a cubesat is you have these uh, pcbs of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters and with connectors so they can each be stacked on top of one another and voila you have a satellite so that's like a lego satellite Exactly, exactly. That's a Lego satellite, right? And because it's all standardized, all the interfaces, everything else is already a standard, industry accepted standard. Uh, so CubeSats are quite easy to build. Mm. They're much less complex because all the thinking, a lot of things are frozen, mm. right? Mm. So you only have to figure out very few things. So, and so, so Rachna, CubeSats, sorry, do you mean, yeah. so depending on the number of these one U cubes you put together, you get different configurations and different results. So you're looking, is that... Uh, so let's, for example, say you said three three cubes together. I'm just simple. Mm -hmm. But somebody else could do something like five cubes together or ten cubes together, and all these would have different results. Is that what you're saying? 
Yeah, so ultimately it depends on the payload, right? So this CubeSat is essentially the bus of the satellite. Mm -hmm. So a bus is basically the transmitter, the receiver, the onboard processing uh, system, and the power conditioning system, you know, all these things, the attitude control system, all the things that are required to keep the satellite alive and running. And the crux, you know, the soul of the satellite, I would say, is, mm -hmm. the, is the payload. So we can either put a camera on it or a spectrometer on it or because we have, uh, if you look at this company called Spire, they're one of the pioneers in, uh, I wouldn't say pioneers, they're one of the leaders in these uh, weather satellites. So they do a lot of weather monitoring using CubeSats. Okay. Right. So it, the, the applications are endless. So mm -hmm. there's image, people doing imaging, the people trying to do communications, people doing weather monitoring and atmospheric studies and even astronomy. That's that's so interesting. And just to take one step back with, with these CubeSats, so you let's even just talk about, you said a mini sat or a micro sat is anything to do with between 100 to 500 uh, mass of volume, uh, mass of weight. Now, what about the launch of this particular satellite? Now that has to, again, have a different setup altogether, right? So even if somebody's building a, a CubeSat, let's say, or a satellite or a, or a mini satellite. Now to get that into orbit, it, it, low Earth orbit at the moment, now how does that work? And it's the same industry or do you all then go and look for somebody who can help you with or launching this particular, uh, this particular hardware? Yeah, so for smaller satellites, there's uh, something called piggybacking, right? Because usually a rocket, um, the capacity of a launch vehicle is much higher. It can take up to a ton or a several tons. And then a lot of times they have a lot of uh, spare capacity, you yeah, know, that's some extra space. That's very interesting. <laughs> some extra space. So they just piggyback on something. And uh, so in these small, but of course, there's a lot of interfacing, you know, you have to mm. talk to the launch provider ahead. So your satellite fits perfectly because, you know, it shouldn't really rattle when taking off. Mm. You have to, <laughs> it has to fit correctly. And also another important thing is um, the orbit of this launch vehicle is determined as in at what point it'll, it's going to let go of the, you know, insert the satellite into the orbit is, de is determined primarily by the primary uh, payload on it, you know, the biggest satellite, the one who's paying them the biggest money. Mm. So let's say I, I have a small satellite and I'm looking for launch opportunities and trying to piggyback, you know, hitchhike. It's like hitchhiking. Right. Basically, you want to say, hey, you know, which way are you going? Okay, I'm kind of headed there. So please drop me <laughs> yeah. other way. Right. Uh, take a lift. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, ask for a lift. So that's the concept of piggybacking. But nowadays, there's also a lot of these. But the problem with this piggybacking is you always you have to keep waiting for the launch of these bigger satellites. I'm and sure. the development time for these larger satellites is obviously much larger, while these small satellites are, can be developed at a very rapid scale. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have a scenario where you have a lot of these little or small satellites waiting to be launched and they're all waiting for these bigger ones to finally finish. Uh, finally get ready for launch. So that kind of, it's, it's more like a lost business opportunity, right? So somebody, it's the opportunity cost for anybody trying to launch these on a commercial basis. So that's when a lot of these small satellite launch vehicles, so which are dedicated uh, launch vehicles for small satellites came up. So here you can either buy the entire launch vehicle and put your uh, few hundred kilogram satellite, or they will collect, you know, they will pool together, everybody, it's like a carpool, all the little satellites that mm -hmm. want to go in one orbit, you carpool and then go to the launch vehicle and say, hey, you know, we want to carpool. And there are many companies which are doing this, um, getting people together. These are called launch aggregators. Mm. So all the launch demand that's there in the industry, they scout for it and they say, hey, okay, you want to go this orbit, you too, you too, you too, come, let's go. You know, And then they go and approach, approach a launch vehicle company and they say, hey, I have 10 people who want to go to this orbit at this inclination. So here's your business. Give me my commission. Mm. So that's a launch aggregator. So yeah, all, all this kinds so of very interesting. This, this happens. Very interesting. And and especially we were talking about the way satellites have developed and got into different stages or the technology has been moving really fast. Do you see this as a challenge in your industry that one part of it, which is the design, has developed and moved forward, but uh, we are now stuck for launching it and if that is not able to keep up with as fast as the technology for satellites are going then there's going to be a, a problem with this whole 
ecosystem of satellites and satellite because you by the time your satellite is ready to launch you may have developed a newer version of it i'm i'm just trying to think of how this whole i'm looking at it from a business perspective and if it yeah had- you're you you are absolutely right actually that's one of the that's why if we look at a lot of these uh, bigger satellites right so they all have the i'm talking about these one ton or like 500 kilogram the satellites which typically take at least 5 or 6 years to develop all these satellites are always lagging in technology mm. like you said because when the proposal was made initially it's like 5 or 7 years ago and there's always already been a technological revolution <laughs> as mm. such in that domain so you're right so most of these satellites are, uh, are quite lagging in technology however coming to these uh, newer satellites like i said there's a lot of um, there's actually an oversupply of uh, launch capacity i would say because especially since spacex you know came up and overturned the entire uh, shaken up and disrupted hmm. the entire launch pricing hmm. uh, because at the end of the day nobody really cares what the what the technology on which the rocket is is running how the engines are made are they 3d printed or i don't know what fancy stuff they're using ultimately the only thing a satellite uh, maker or somebody who wants to launch a satellite will think about is how much will you charge hmm. so it boils down to that and that's where spacex has completely nailed it right so but but however spacex you know you can only piggyback on spacex doesn't have a small satellite launch vehicle you know a dedicated one mm. so hence there is uh, there are companies like rocket labs and these other companies which are doing but this kind of also been uh, i i would say it's it's sort of like a bubble there's like too many small satellite launch vehicle companies there are too many rocket launch companies mm-hmm. uh, quite more than the than the the supply than the demand as in the number of satellites being made however i mean more than this you know i think the bigger aspect is we haven't quite so all this building satellites or rockets all this is upstream you know because we are sending things up you know building mm. the infrastructure mm. part but and the downstream aspect which is actually utilizing these satellites or the images they provide or you know the communication facilities they provide or all the other services they provide all this is yet to reach its complete potential mm. so in a way i think there's kind of an oversupply already of because if you see in the next 10 years like, there are some what 10000 satellite in the next 5 years there are some 10000 satellites which are going to be launched wow and it's of all sizes and it's and you don't really have the ecosystem the downstream ecosystem in place mm. and so i think that's the bigger thing we need to tackle first yeah and just for a lot of our young listeners who may have an entrepreneurial uh, tend to them and would be thinking i'm sure they're listening to you and they're thinking about so uh, which direction should i be going if we are going to now get into the privatization of space and there are a lot of companies coming up when you say that it is it is already uh, there's a lot of work going on here and there's a backlog are you saying or would you be able to advise anyone which direction should this be going if people are thinking about it from a private point of view and setting up something yeah yeah definitely absolutely um first of all um going um, i mean as per giving advices i my first advice is always follow your passion what you believe in uh, but with a pinch of reality so yeah so uh, upstream of course building a satellite or a rocket company is obviously it has it is highly capital in- intensive and it's very highly risky business especially in india we do not have such a great uh, market for i mean th- there's no market yet i would say but of course there would definitely be a market in future all that said there are a couple of uh, really amazing companies really amazing startups in india who are trying to build satellites trying to build rockets small satellite launch vehicles so that's 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 awesome people should take a chance people should take a risk uh, that's really good for the ecosystem however if a student is not uh, or you know if somebody with an entrepreneurial spirit is has not quite decided on what they want to do then i think the most the safest bet or the most exciting bet i would say would be to focus on the downstream you know to, to focus on the problem because a lot of times um, you know the space industry is dominated by engineers and we are always occupied with solving an engineering problem 
but we often fail to step back and look at the problem in its entirety. Okay, what is this problem that I'm trying to solve? Can this be solved by something else other than space or something else that's already existing? Am I reinventing the wheel? So a lot of times engineers don't really think that <laughs> we just keep, right? And also space is very sexy. It's very exciting. So, uh, you know, we try to rush ahead, but yeah. I, I would really say um, uh, this area of satellite applications would be very, very interesting, right? For example, I'll give you a small example. So one of my friends who runs, um, you know, who works with this uh, in the in the area of satellite analytics. So he actually went to a wine conference and, and then started talking to people about space. And first of all, people were really freaked out. It was like, you're a space guy. What, <laughs> what the hell are you doing in a wine conference? This is for connoisseurs and, you know, winemakers and so on. And a lot of these winemakers had no idea because a lot of them had these huge vineyards spanning many acres, you know, many, a, a large uh, landmass. They had no idea that you can monitor the health of your vineyard or your grapes uh, by using spectral, hyperspectral imagery or satellite imagery. Wow. So for them, this was quite new. And then I, I, I guess at the end of the day, he managed to broker a deal. And there's um, another friend of mine, um, so he wanted, so he got a contract, he got a, um, and a, one of the projects that they got is to monitor how much grass uh, the cows are uh, eating every day or an, on an every day on, or every week, mm. right? Because the amount of the quantity of grass consumed by these cows would affect their milk output. And if they knew in advance how much output these cows would give in, in terms of milk, that would really help them in their supply chain. Mm. Right. So these really weird, this, these crazy innovative Absolutely. solutions using, this, right? So, uh, and I heard about, uh, I don't know about it was the same wine conference, but I was reading an article recently where there is certain wine that's going to actually be aged in, in space. And that's going to be really expensive. Have you heard of that one? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's more exciting uh, news, right? <laughs> then, uh, yeah, that, that's definitely there. Uh, it's one of the fancy aspects i think uh, yeah. of space <laughs> oh, could could be yeah, the, the, because the of clickbait the, uh, space yeah yeah the i mean uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, i mean i'm no wine connoisseur i'm sure there are many people who would uh, pay insane amounts of money or would be very interested from a connoisseur's perspective on how this wine tastes and mm. the many flavors to it but uh, but yeah, I, think, I am too <laughs> sorry sorry but i think something similar was done uh, here in india as well with agriculture and with crops where either weather patterns or uh, certain activities in the environment could be studied or analyzed over a period of time and then the farmers could uh, be guided better as to how what should be done or what predictively they should be ready for right yes there are actually a couple of companies there's also this uh, satsure and you know several companies in india that are doing uh, a lot of exciting work the thing that you're talking about is this crop insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are able to, so because in India, the the sizes, the farm sizes are very small. So, you know, people owning like uh, farmers owning half an acre or a quarter acre and these sizes are very small. And also we have a lot of farm subsidies and um, insurance premiums for these farms. Mm -hmm. And these are very difficult to fix, you know, even when you're, um, giving an insurance when you're when during the time of settling the insurance claim and also when calculating how much insurance premium you can ask the farmer to pay it's very difficult because you have to send like actual people you have to send people to go and take or you know collect the soil samples or uh, evaluate if there's been a drought if there's you know what the conditions have been so this is really difficult on such a large scale and especially with um very little infrastructure you know trans public transport infrastructure in a country like india um so in this way satellite imageries would help uh, satellite imaging would help a lot mm -hmm. it would help the government it would help but the the end of the day the thing is i think the biggest thing is um, who is going to pay for these but maybe that's an well, that's a discussion for some other day mm -hmm. who's but going to pay for want, it yeah so who's going to pay for it right so it's yeah. ultimately it has to be the government or so as so my advice to an entrepreneur or a budding entrepreneur if he wants to look at this problem is uh, of course i'm i'm no entrepreneur uh, but i from what i've observed from a lot of my entrepreneurial friends i'm always surrounded by these space entrepreneurs 
from what I observed uh, from these people, first of all, take a step back. If you identify a problem, just take a step back and try to be the devil's advocate, you know, mm. try to think why you should not be doing it with space, why you should not be solving this X problem using space. Try to think of other terrestrial solutions, something that's already there, something that's cheaper, that's better, more accessible. And then if you rule everything out and if you think, yes, space is the way this is this problem is going to be solved in the most effective way, then OK, step one done. Mm. And then try to look at who are the stakeholders, who for who am I solving a problem for? Right. So b because that determines where you're going to get your money from. Mm. So ultimately, the point of a business is, you know, to get money. So you have to figure out who am I solving this problem for and try to get them on board. And it's tough, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's, but I, I'm, it's, it's a very rewarding journey from as far as I've seen. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and before I just want to close down on this particular segment on satellites, I think we've had some great insight into the satellite world. But to, to ask you uh, something about the future, and this could just be, uh, news that we read outside your industry or the impression that we have where we've been told that in the future there are possibilities that a particular organization or a corporate body could want to or could be wanting to launch satellites of their own and each organization would have their own, own satellite like you have servers or like you have uh, internet providers but is that something that you see as coming up? Uh, you mean organizations as in space? Uh, no, I mean I mean corporate organizations. Just for example, uh, a university who's into research. They may want ah. to use something like a CubeSat that is specific to what they're doing. Yeah, so, um, so if you're talking about communication, right? right. So I, I don't really think it makes sense. First of all, universities or research institutions are... Uh, kind of cash strapped. Mm. So I, I don't think it really makes a business case for them to have their own satellite network or their own internet infrastructure using satellites, mm. uh, especially because now, um, I mean, that's also one thing uh, in the future, right? When we are talking about sat satcom, you know, satellite communication, there's always going to be this tug of war uh, between fiber optic cables and satellites, mm. because now fiber optics are like, transatlantic cables and all these are really, really cheap. And uh, so I would say that satellites, uh, sat satellite internet or broadband through satellites uh, would make sense, mostly in remote areas when you don't, you know, and not in urban areas, because in urban or concentrated parts of the world, you already have enough uh, fiber optic cable. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. quite going to take care of you. Uh, because even if you look at the Starlinks, you know, the yeah. Uh, the Starlink uh, holds, has also released these uh, uh, these modems, uh, what do you think? the satellite receivers, mm. you know, just like the set-top box we have at home. But they're, it's uh, it's still, the, the price is still uh, quite high for the Indian market, I would say, or for people in general with broadband with requirements, mm. unless they happen to be in a really, really remote place. And requiring netflix yeah. in antarctica or something yeah. and, and what but about, even antarctica has a direct link satellite it, right? links and, yeah, and yeah. What, what about autonomous driving and uh, uh, cars that are coming out is there yeah. some case there that this can be used in the future iot yes iot is definitely like one area uh, but again i mean i think we need to see we need to see how the thing is it's very tempting to use uh, satellites for everything mm. Uh, but however, we should also look at, is it really cheaper and better using satellites than terrestrial? I don't know, because, mm. uh, right, because oftentimes terrestrial solutions, you know, on ground sensors or these uh, little sensors, in situ sensors, mm. often these solve the problem and right. don't really require satellite because there's this huge cost of procuring the imagery because with satellites, unless you have a dedicated network, like uh, a constellation for yourself, Mm. The biggest problem with satellite imagery today is, of course, a lot of satellite imagery is free. You can get it from different portals. But the biggest problem is getting is the timing, you know, mm. uh, like, for example, getting a pic. I can always get a free picture of my house or my farm or my parking lot. But if I want it on a specific day, it's very unlikely that I will get it on that specific day. Mm. 
True. Right. So the timing and how frequently am I going to get it? How frequently do I want to monitor it? Right, right. And Raja, so, uh, earlier you spoke about solving problems. If mm -hmm. uh, somebody wanted to get into something, but this borders on what I'm going to ask you next, because could it be that we are creating certain problems now, problems that are not yet there or problems that are already there on the horizon? And you spoke about 10,000 satellites in the next five years. Now, that brings me to the problem of space debris. And if this is going at the kind of speed that it is, is there somebody monitoring what exactly is happening out there because of all the extra debris that I, I know the... The International Space Station had about, I think, three incidents in the last one year that came to close collision or collision with small. But now when we have the private sector getting in, do you think that we have enough of regulations as far as our space law is concerned? Or is it time now to take this seriously? Yeah, I think it's uh, it has been the time to take it seriously for a while. But like like all other problems, as um, humanity keeps ignoring, mm. <laughs> you know, like climate change and everything else. Yeah, yeah, I think we we. we but this uh, one, we, we may just be ahead of time. Not we are not ahead of time here, but with the kind of work coming up or the scaling up of it, I think now is probably the time to get a little bit more serious about it, right? Definitely, definitely. I I think see. Uh, I mean, the, the, the issue, like I said, the issue of space debris has been a long time. And for example, the International Space Station, you know, which is a huge, uh, uh, it's a huge collaboration and kind of the pride of humanity. It keeps dodging a satellite or uh, it keeps dodging a space debris like every week. Wow. So it has to constantly keep moving up and down in its orbit every week. Right. So that's the threat oh, of space I didn't, debris. I, I didn't know that every week. That That's <laughs> quite amazing. Yeah, almost, more or less, yeah, you know, like yeah. many times. Uh, tens of times a year so so yeah so this has been quite serious but but like all things right the only time we are actually going to sit up and take notice and do something against something is when your financial interests mm. uh, get affected so like and, and you're absolutely right now that we have so many companies uh, with assets of their own in space private companies of course they have to take a call but uh, from the legal perspective, we do not have, so for example, in the airspace, right? So we have this air traffic management mm. and you have a air traffic controller. We constantly, every pilot, you know, speaks to the ATC, the air traffic controller, and it's all regulated. So that way we don't really have anything in, uh, in space because of course, space is uh, global commons, you know, <laughs> there cannot, no nationality claims it. And unless everybody comes together and uh, tries to have some sort of a space traffic management authority that will actually have the powers to enforce it. Mm -hmm. They can only give guidelines. So there's enforcement, just like you know the high seas, the maritime. You can't really have any enforcement mm -hmm. because it doesn't fall into anybody's jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so it only has to come out of collaborations and cooperations and understanding between different stakeholders. Right. And these guidelines that you're talking about, is are these the 21 guidelines that we hear about or we see published? These, so the 20, so you're talking about the Outer Space Treaty. Outer Space Treaty, these, yeah. Yeah. So these are actually quite broad. So these, um, all these guidelines, the Outer Space Treaty and everything started at the beginning of the Cold War when, you know, you mm. had these, the bipolar world trying to outdo each other in space and everything. Uh, it started then because... Uh, both countries, both spacefaring countries, mm. basically were really scared that the the other country would, uh, you know, launch a nuclear, uh, put a nuclear bomb essentially on a satellite and then just drop it on the other country, mm. right? So if this was against. Um, so these were mostly measures against this. So weaponization, for instance, in space is not allowed, but the very meaning of weaponization has changed. Right. So uh, 50 years ago or 30 years ago, weaponization means actually having some actual bomb in space. Mm. But right now, weaponization means uh, I can go to, let's say there is this, uh, let's say there's a communication satellite that controls a lot of uh, ATMs in the south of India. And then I collide it with my little satellite and that's kaput. Mm. And just imagine no ATMs in the south of India working wow. for like many days. Right. Wow. So hey, this is a very extreme, you know, yeah, very but, extreme example. But, but even if you use even if you use it for surveillance, so when I say surveillance, I mean spying, that mm. is in some way a form of weaponizing your asset, right? Because you are having an impact directly on 
uh, bringing something down yeah that's uh i mean that 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 i would call as more as intelligence like mm. signal intelligence mm. there are a lot of satellites actually uh, that uh, spy on other satellites no oh, that's interesting spies uh, so in space so this is called yeah yeah ex- literally yes so this that's is called cool. uh, this is called signal intelligence mm-hmm. so that's also but of course it's not really published anywhere or it's not there's not much resources available online of but course but it is being done <laughs> it's being done yes All right and yeah. what about this mission by esa or esa the clear uh, space one which is supposed to launch in 2025 and, and is that the right way forward uh yeah so bef- before we get into this uh, since we were on the topic of space debris right so i'd also like to say that um, space debris yes we are being irresponsible about it however there's also a lot of efforts towards mitigation of the space debris right so because uh, one of the biggest problems in uh, uh space debris is we are unable to track it completely the models you know the tracking models that we have are not complete mm-hmm. and there's a lot of work being done uh, in terms of research or even by commercial companies to to map these uh, uh space debris better and to provide better uh, insights you know better predict the orbits of this of these debris and the impact and potential collisions mm-hmm. so that's also being done there are for example there is this there are a couple of companies called uh, Uh, in, in the US and even in Europe, which are trying to offer these um, traffic management services. Mm. So basically, like say you are a satellite operator, and they will always keep a lookout in your orbit if there's a potential collision and warn you ahead in time. Okay. Yeah. So that's one interesting uh, mm. companies. Mm. I just wanted to check with you. Also, thinking about the way uh, things are moving, and we know that SpaceX is uh, working on reusable rockets and stuff like that. in the future now i'm talking about really way out into the future i'm going out a bit here we could work on reusable satellites and everything coming back down here rather than disintegrating in space and is that a thought or even a possibility and you uh, know where you can reuse and control stuff because from what i can hear or maybe i'm wrong is once stuff is sent out it is then free to you know after its life ends which earlier in the session you spoke about 3 years for a small satellite right you said what happens to that after 3 years yeah so depending uh, on the altitude essentially all these um satellite there's something called orbit decay so basically because you know in in space you are essentially in space orbiting but uh, but still there is a finite amount of air resistance that the satellite is going to face mm. right and depending on the cross section of the satellite you are going to experience uh, drag and because of this drag your velocity decreases and as the velocity decreases the orbit also keeps falling uh, because uh, the velocity is determined by the orbit i mean if you want to stay at this particular orbit that is at this particular altitude the satellite needs to have this particular velocity right mm. as per orbital dynamics orbital mechanics and as the velo- as it experiences drag it keeps you know uh, spiraling inwards and but this is a very very slow process so for a lot of satellites the natural decay um uh, occurs for 20 so so the ma- as per the space debris mitigation di- guidelines uh, right now um, your space object has to decay within a period of 25 years wow right but that's that's just not enough because you have these on one hand we have these crazy number of companies launching thousands of satellites which are going to be uh, non operational in 3 years and then after 3 years we're going to launch more satellites to mm. replace them but all of these are taking like 25 years so obviously and, and all of them will be legally legal aliens in space anyways exactly exactly and they are within the space debris mitigation guidelines mm. right and it this is just not enough so of course there's a lot of companies uh, which are trying to actively you know use uh, use some sort of a little uh, propulsion system even if your satellite is really small you can have these very micro mini thrusters which give these you know very little uh, mini, uh, micro newtons of thrust mm. so you can make them spiral down more faster you can deorbit them essentially mm. because they all burn up in in space when they reenter so so yeah it's uh, it's nothing is set like i said there's yeah. no enforcement authority nobody is holding anybody accountable yeah. so but uh, but rachna there. this is this is a great uh, time to go back to what you said earlier about uh, our young listeners is there a problem to be solved and we've just told you what the problem is to anybody listening or young kid it's space debris you come out with a way to solve this problem and you're going to be saving the planet 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely. I'm sure it's um, um, yeah, it's it's one fun problem to tackle. Yeah. Uh, especially these young, um, especially because uh, the space debris problem is fun because it deals with a lot of these orbital mechanics. You know, like all these uh, the one of the exciting parts of doing space, mm. right? Uh, and I'm, I'm sure anyone who's played a lot of Kerbal space program or I, I was all about, these simulations. I was about to say that I was just, if you can develop a, a virtual a video game in space where you're able to capture space debris and whoever captures the most literally <laughs> gets some kind of, of a coin, maybe a Bitcoin, that would be an incentive <laughs> as well, right? Yeah, that would be awesome. It could be the next PUBG, you know? Yeah, that, that would be a great <laughs> idea. But no, I think this has been such a fascinating uh subject Rashna, and thank you for all the information that you've given us and I, I just also want to get back to Rashna, what you're currently doing now you're working with uh, Berlin Space Technology and I do know that you're all working on small satellites as well as uh, you specifically are into embedded systems right now yeah. to come to, to just get to this particular area here for listeners who are also here to listen to you as far as software is concerned or, or computer design or engineering is concerned would you just tell us what do you mean about embedded systems when you say that that's what your field is uh okay so embedded systems it's it's just literally a, a computer a processor and a bunch of these different peripherals mm. right so a washing machine or any anything it's it's an embedded system Mm -hmm. So everything is embedded. It's a complete system. It has intelligence, as in it, it can do, it can process functions. It can do things. So anything that can process by itself and does not need any external input mm. to process and to execute whatever it has processed, that's an embedded system. Okay. So that's that's a very broad term. No, that's that's very uh, easy in, to understand. Uh, yeah, it, it actually helps, you know, because uh, when you're communicating with people from other sectors. Um, because often engineers, we are at a loss of words to not use tech when when we are asked not to use technical words because that's when, all when words. I, words when I read head. about you being involved in embedded systems, I was like, wow, okay, I'm going to have trouble here. So <laughs> I wanted to get that out of the way. But when you say washing machine, then you know, okay, you've made it easy for all of us. Yeah, it's, so it's you, not. You it's use the right example. Fast. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just a fancy. I mean, I think a lot of uh, things, uh, things mm. are quite can be quite fancy. Perhaps not quantum mechanics yeah. or yeah. you know fancy stuff. Anyway, so yeah, so my work as um, an embedded system. So in in my previous um, previously, I have worked a lot with uh, these FPGAs. You know, programming a lot of these FPGAs, like I've elaborated before, mm. and. So now I'm working mostly on the microcontrollers. So, so my job, so uh, I'm part of the software team at uh, Berlin Space Technologies, where I work in. And BST, uh, Berlin Space Technologies, we built these 100 kilogram class satellites for uh, Earth observation. Mm -hmm. And software team, so software is not like software out in the real world. Uh, software in space involves a lot of electronics knowledge and a lot of uh, um, you know, deep diving into the into how the subsystems and everything works because mm -hmm. you're essentially doing embedded systems. You know, you're writing code, you're writing software, you're trying to talk to, I don't know, uh, let's say you're trying to automate something, you're trying to talk to a power supply device and you're trying to give it commands and sometimes it's not working and then you see, hey, my cable is broken or oops, I'm using the wrong protocol or, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes, so you get your, um, so, and also embedded system, uh, when you're working uh, on software uh, on a satellite, or when you're working in um, building uh, satellites, when you're doing a lot of software, you should have a little bit of uh, knowledge of electronics, you know, where you should not put a resistor or where you should put a capacitor or, you know, a little mm. bit of basic knowledge would be great. Mm. So my job is basically we write these uh, command handling protocols for the satellite. And we also, because us is a very small company, we try to automate a lot of th things. We try to automate a lot of testing procedures. So somebody just presses some button and the test goes on for like five days. Mm -hmm. So everything. So we try to automate and we're also trying to build a, a satellite factory in India and you know, can check out the page of PST for more details. Okay. Uh, so my work essentially is because it's a small company, I've done everything from uh, 
building a harness doing some soldering you know burning some stuff <laughs> accidentally <laughs> yeah so i've done it all so it's uh, it's quite fun interesting and when you say building these software systems for space mm-hmm. or you writing these now in a industry where there has been a lot of history and there is a lot of analysis and there are a lot of people who've gone wrong and you want to build and you want to move forward innovation in in those cases could be let me just see what happened before and the mistakes people made and i don't want to make the same mistake so you use analysis but this being relatively new rachna how do you approach this because who do you talk to there may not be too many as uh, there is for example in the banking industry or the av aviation industry right there may be a small group of you how do you get that information or how do you know what you're doing is moving in the right direction how do you check yourself Yeah so a lot of these uh, not just me a lot of space companies uh, maybe i should give the example of pst so pst was basically the founders were students at the tu berlin the, at the technical university berlin which mm. was and they were involved in the university student satellite projects and that's where you know and that's and after their graduation they took a lot of this know how a lot of these experience and then they started this company right so a lot of companies uh, especially building upstream stuff across the world they definitely uh, they are built on some sort of heritage a lot of these are university spin offs or uh, they are either spun off from larger companies for example airbus you know this company also has a bunch of spin offs and there's definitely a lot of heritage or in some cases these people have worked the founders of this company have worked in have a lot of domain knowledge they have worked in a lot of uh, in other research areas or uh, for example there is one company uh, one of uh, my podcast episodes actually so this person has worked in the spanish coast guard doing a lot of aerial imaging of and monitoring the seas and then they started a company for uh, the same purpose you know the same monitoring of this maritime seas but mm-hmm. using satellites right so they so most people bring a sort of heritage knowledge with them and however all this said it's definitely very difficult to start you know all this code especially nobody publishes a lot of this online exactly. right exactly that, that's what i was trying to get at is how do you it because this may not be available so you have to actually do it all from scratch right yeah that's that's definitely true and this is where uh, cube and this is exactly the reason why cube sats are so famous or so popular Mm. because the cubesat standards you know even the a lot of the software is uh, available a basic software a lot of you know the p- peripherals everything is like quite sorted like you said legos in a really mm-hmm. great uh, <laughs> panel so it, that's it's much easier but it's definitely very difficult to start building um these 100 kg class or higher satellites because this segment has not been standardized yet yet mm-hmm. these this part of the satellites right so it it needs for example bst they've been even though they you know they had really rich experience in working on the actual satellite missions of tu berlin and and tu berlin has built an insane number of satellites so it's a really thriving uh, uh, you know scene in the mm-hmm. university they built mm-hmm. really amazing satellites they even do commercially they even sell so that's also quite awesome mm-hmm. uh, so in spite of having had so much of experience it's still uh, we've been building like satellite subsystems for about 10 years So usually a lot of times uh, it makes sense to start building one subsystem at a time you know you don't have to build the whole satellite you can just build i don't know like an onboard computer or uh, some part like a power conditioning unit or just a battery or something and then slowly you know grow into building these uh, larger systems mm. but there are a lot of companies uh, now a lot of new startups which are deep diving into the whole you know like you, if you deep diving and taking this planet approach wow. planet labs for example mm. right planet mm. labs also it's completely fully vertically integrated okay. they build their satellites they do the operations they launch them and they are, i mean they don't launch them they do the operations and they also take care of the downstream aspect that is the satellite image processing and everything mm. so there are companies that are popping up around the world which are following this uh, fully integrated model of building satellites mm. um and it's tough but people are doing it yeah so. yeah and you were talking about a sharing of this information or maybe sharing of this knowledge so it just brings us back to the esg or the you know the every company organization or individual has to have some environmental social and governance responsibility whether it's sharing of knowledge or collaborating because i don't know especially if, if we're going to venture into space which we are 
whether this could be done alone. And when I say alone, I don't literally mean alone. But you are going to need people to collaborate from various backgrounds, various countries. And that's the best way you're going to get everybody's view and you're going to be able to make an informed decision, right? That's yes, uh, that's absolutely true, Hakim. Uh, however, we should also note the fact that space is increasingly becoming strategic, mm. right? There's, uh, uh, of course, space has already always started off that way um, across the world, except perhaps in India, because you know, in India, our the roots of the space program are not really strategic. It's more for the benefit of the common person and uh, you know, socio develop uh, socio economic development and so on and so forth. Uh, but even in India or across the world, everywhere space is becoming more and more strategic. So that way, I think it's quite a tricky uh, thing to handle, mm -hmm. right? Just like nuclear technology. Correct. It's not, we are not there yet, but I think it's, yeah, it's getting there. Absolutely. And on, on, on days, Rachna, uh, when you're not working or when you're not doing what you're doing, because from what I can see, I don't know how you have time to do anything else. But on days when you are just not doing stuff, what? Uh, tell me something. I know that you like reading, and your favorite your favorite book currently, or your favorite series of books, is the Three Body Problem, right? Yeah, yeah. So I I'm a huge fan of space science fiction. Uh, I absolutely enjoy it. And the Three Body, yeah. If anybody wants to check out uh, the Three Body Problem by this uh, Chinese author Liu Cixin, mm. it was published a long time ago in China, but it only was translated to English much later than that. It's, uh, but that is something I would call a hard science fiction. So it's it's pretty intense. I'm a, a quick reader, but even for me, and I've read a lot of space sci-fi, you know, from Asimov to Clark to a lot of people. Mm. Um, but every 200 pages, I had to just put the book down and take a day off because uh -huh. there's so much stuff in it. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. But if somebody wants a lighter version of it, I would definitely recommend my other favorite. It's uh, the series by, it's the Wayfarer series oh, by that's... Becky Chambers. And she introduces a lot of multi-species and it's, it's not really human centric. It's mm. very casual. It's very fun. Yeah. So that's a light read. Light read. But the yeah. three body problem, like you said, that's hard, uh, that is currently uh, a scenario that has played out with exoplanets, right? You do have, and the three body problem, just to break it down a little bit, if you could, you're talking about uh, a particular planet that has three, st uh, three stars or three suns. Is that the premise of this whole thing? Uh, yes, I would say yes. It starts off with that. I mean, I hate to spoil it for people. Sp but, spoiler uh, alert. Okay. We <laughs> Spoiler alert for anybody who's going to be reading it. <laughs> yeah, so there is a, oh, I, I, as somebody who loves, who loves reading and hates spoilers, I really hate to say this. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it has an element of a world where there is, um, of course, there's aliens and uh -huh. there's a world, there are three suns and yeah. uh, because the three body problem also is like a very interesting mathematical problem mm, right mm. so to predict because two body problem we've like we've predicted it quite well mm. it's uh, the three body problem is quite complex mathematically speaking as well mm. so there's a lot of math involved in this there's a lot of virtual reality there's a lot of astrophysics like really really high quality astrophysics wow. so a lot of times i had to like go back and like make sure that I'm, under, I'm getting the astrophysics right. So, yeah, in, in fact, that's what Schopenhauer said. He said, if you don't read a book twice, then that's not the way you go to read a book. You have to read a book. <laughs> and if you've read it twice, then that speaks for itself. And you touched on something very interesting. We are, uh, just want to check with you. You said there are a lot of aliens in that book. Now, do we even talk about what is currently happening because of everybody who's following news? Or even if you're not following news, you're going to get a message on your phone saying that, Okay, there's a particular object that we're going to be talking about that we've been visited, we've not been visited. The US government is going to be coming out with some secret documents. Uh, Jamie Cobell is on every channel and Netflix is. So, and you earlier, it, it struck me when you mentioned that you had these uh, satellites at low Earth orbit and the Russians have been doing it for quite some time. So that's where I just try to put my skeptical hat on here without jumping to any conclusion. Most of this could be, I'm just still saying could be, either a satellite, a failed satellite, a controlled satellite. And should we even jump to conclusions because 
something is not identifiable, that doesn't mean we know what it is. We can just leave it there, right? Yeah, I mean, um, I think a lot of these UFOs are basically different countries, uh, you know, running their military or their advanced uh, uh, experiments. Uh, because especially in space, right? Uh, a lot of countries have really amazing capability. For example, they even have like five or 10 centimeter resolution space cameras, and they've had it for a very long time. So what we see in the commercial space is a very, very downgraded form of what is actually available. For instance, the GPS, you know, commercial GPS, the accuracy is 20 centimeters to 20 meters. Mm. But the actual one, which is available to these strategic users is, is way less than that. Mm. It's way higher as in better accuracy. So always the highest levels of uh, technological advancement is obviously going to be in the strat for the strategic users, you know, of government, mm. the defense uh, for F F of any government across the world. So I would attribute, attribute a lot of these uh, UFO sightings uh, to the governments not being very willing to disclose their activities. Mm. Mm. Uh, but if but speaking of, uh, you know, alien life, um, I don't know if you heard of this Fermi paradox. Yeah. So, right. So basically, it means. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you know what it means. Maybe I'll <laughs> yeah, elaborate for your it. users. Yeah. Yeah. So it's 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 nothing. So in its simplest terms, it's um, first of all there's a high probability of uh, sentient life. You know, life as we know it to exist in this galaxy. First of all, given the size of the whole uh, of the observable universe, basically mm -hmm. it's huge and we have also discovered a lot of earth-like planets you know the same at the optimal distance from their star you know with the with a nice oxygen rich environment all the conditions that are perfect uh, like on earth right in spite of all this evidence uh, the, the, the paradox is basically how come we don't see anybody how come we've never met anybody or mm. how come we've never heard from anybody in spite of a great probability that they can exist a lot of sentient life. Mm. So, uh, so yeah, so the Fermi paradox is like quite interesting and there's been a lot of solutions to this paradox. And one book that I would really recommend is uh, for anyone who wants to, you know, dive into this subject is this book is called, Where Is Everybody? It's by Stephen Webb. Mm. So in this book, this person basically gives 50 solutions to this paradox, to the Fermi paradox. Wow. 50 possible ones and they talk about uh, civilizations and how you know uh, uh, stage one civilization and yeah I think like for example the stage one civilization is somebody who has uh, perfected fusion mm, and we are just at the edge of stage one now yeah <laughs> hopefully a few countries have done it and I hope that it becomes more ubiquitous in a in a safe way mm. And then space two gets into galactic uh, harnessing of energy. And I think space three is where you can then harness all the energy uh, f from of the sun, uh, yeah. of, of the sun, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Depends on exactly, exactly. Yeah, mm, I think so. I, I'm yeah. sure this book will be quite interesting for you. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Our listeners <laughs> would, I think even Macho Kaku, I don't know if you've heard or, or, yeah, or, yeah, or read of any of his books, but he's been a big proponent of this. Uh, I, I, I remember a book by him called Hyperspace. It was probably yes. one of the first books that I read. I, I must have read it four times. Maybe at that time it was new for us or for me. And that got me very interested in dimensions. And then, you know, you, you tend to go into different directions with uh, string theories and, and trying to understand a little bit more. Definitely. Uh, Michio Kaku is, is incredible. I've also spent a lot of my undergrad years, you know, poring over his books. Of course, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I still haven't understood a lot of it. So I have to go yeah. back and read someday. But speaking of this understanding different dimensions, right? I don't know if you know about uh, this fiction called Flatland. Oh, that's a, so, that's a brilliant book by, uh, <laughs> by Abbott, right? What was his yeah. name? Yeah. So that really yeah. helped me try to kind of... So uh, even in the three-body problem, there's also this for for the dimensions and there's yeah. and he uh, the author it's amazing that you bought that one up because i still i still uh, uh, i still haven't got over that book because that's just absolutely stunning yeah i, I just googled it it's edwin abbott edwin abbott I right guess. right yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the characterizations or the stories especially that part where 
this particular monster from the other dimension is trapped in that particular dimension through yeah. through a spear right when you read that or you get to that part of the book you just are amazed yeah, that's yeah, a brilliant book <laughs> yeah and especially i mean what was written 100 more than 100 years ago originally published 1884 wow This is like the George Orwell kind of crazy stuff, right? Yeah, Which and is published George, way ahead. George Orwell or Brave, the Time Bra- Machine, Brave New World. It's oh yeah. So you could. I, I think this is the same league as these crazy, uh, amazing uh, books like uh, the Time Machine and the George Orwell stuff, which was published like hundred. Yeah, yeah, more than definitely, years ago. Wow. definitely ahead of its time. And and there's a saying about if you want to be successful in any venture or business, you got to have three things. You got to have the idea. You've got to have your rhetoric. But the most important time is you got to have your timing right. So it could be a great idea, but you may just be ahead of time or after time. It's true with a lot of um, artists and also uh, as well, right? Way yeah. ahead of their time. A lot of artists who unfortunately died penniless, mm. but then their artwork fetching billions or millions. Absolutely. Much later. Or yeah. even 2001 a space odyssey. I don't know if you've seen that movie. Yes, that's a cult classic. <laughs> yeah. All, all of a sudden last year, I don't know if you've been following this, but there was a monolith that appeared somewhere in the US. in one yes. of the, and then uh, for, uh, till today there are monoliths that are being appearing all over the world yeah it's it's definitely amazing i mean the more we think about it uh, the more it's um, it it seems possible right i i would love to it's it's for me it's a very sad thought that we are alone in this universe in this big grand universe and i would be very very happy to meet any of our galactic neighbors <laughs> mm-hmm. so i i don't know I, did did carl sagan say there are two possibilities one is that we are alone and the other one is that we are not alone and both are equally scary yes <laughs> so, yes i mean uh, it's also possible that we are so insignificant that nobody wants to talk to us right we are probably this uh, civilization at its infant at this infancy was still communicating using radio waves mm-hmm. Mm. and the civilization the probably the advanced civilizations are just looking at us like oh my god why yeah. are they so primitive you know like yeah. we look at people using stone tools yeah uh, <laughs> so and- it's possible because one analogy that i've seen somewhere is uh, for example let's say there's a bridge or a highway being constructed somewhere a very fancy highway mm. and there's a ant hill like right next to it nobody really notices the ant hill neither would the ant hill understand what's going on because mm. they're so uh, yeah lifetimes of intellect apart yeah. so that's and even this data possible. that you guys have been getting in from your space industry where you zoom out of our particular solar system and then get zoom out of our galaxy as well you then begin to wonder is this if somebody is looking from the other side they're going to see exactly what you said it's just an ant hill and and they'd be driving past and especially if it's a let's say stage 3 civilization i don't think they would be interested in stopping and saying hello to the ants no i don't think so <laughs> especially i mean it's it's not even like we have uh, any great resources to offer as well right so the only reason anybody would stop is for resources mm. or to connect but yeah but again i mean all this is again um, looking at it uh, it this is all looking for life as we know it mm. right this is more like anthropomorphizing uh, yeah. yeah yeah life so it's it's very difficult just like it's so difficult to even imagine a fourth dimension like operating in a fourth dimension mm. uh i think it's very difficult to think unlike a human to think not to not think like a human because that's all we've mm. only known mm. and we're talking about 11 dimensions now right i mean fourth is just mind blowing anyways it we was. we can't uh, can you imagine 11 <laughs> yeah i mean i i think i don't know from what i've read from uh, my given my limited knowledge and my reading of michio kako uh, i think these i don't think a lot of these dimensions exist exist at the macro scale i think a lot of these exist at the quantum scale right mm. or am i getting it mixed yeah, up yeah absolutely absolutely it's it's all quantum i mean they could be very close to us and that's a different uh, world right if you start talking about the quantum world then you get you border on to very crazy stuff because oh, you're yeah. opening up windows and doors that uh, you can't close after that and it just leads into <laughs> it leads all over the place yeah 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 well, I, but i really hope uh, quantum computers and all this also takes off because it opens it opens this um, you know amazing computational opportunities to mm. us 
Mm. Because right now, a lot of, yeah, we, especially in the technology world, we are severely limited by te- computational capabilities. And uh, that's going to be quite fun, especially mm. in artificial intelligence or a lot of these. Of course, it's a double-edged sword, but yeah. I hope we have the wisdom to yeah. wield it wisely. Yeah. And Rachna, I know we've been taking a lot of, lot of your time. I hope, hope you don't mind continuing for just a few more minutes. No, I would absolutely love this so conversation. I, I just wanted to ask you, since you, you're actually building code and you're writing programs and things like that, the next question for you is another interesting one, which for me, I'm just trying to figure out is what about this current debate on consciousness? And is somebody or is Rachna going to one day write a code or a software that is then going to all of a sudden develop consciousness or is some future person going to do that and our machines are start, going to start getting conscious? Wow, this is, uh, this is one topic that I'm absolutely fascinated about, but I am probably not the right person to... Uh, I have zero clue about all this, uh, but, but maybe I will just give my opinion. However, uh, I would like to you know, re, uh, repeat that as a space engineer, we are working on a lot of technology from yesterday <laughs> so we're not really at the helm of it yeah so a lot of for example i write a lot of my code in c like like we have all the code that sits on the satellites is c okay like not even c plus plus it's okay. c code okay. <laughs> right it's okay. like it's super basic so uh, because we are also interfacing with a lot of hardware and it's uh, it's already a huge um, it's very challenging to get everything working mm. For I think it's more of a personal ethical or a moral question, right? Mm. So it depends on firstly how people define a consciousness as. Mm. So I think the big problem here we need to first arrive at a common definition of consciousness. Mm. So is does consciousness mean uh, given this input the brain will provide this output? Mm. Is it like like you know like this black box? Right. Or is it something more? You know, is it uh, because even right now, it's if you look at the um, the automate uh, the automated driving systems, mm. the carless uh, driverless cars, mm. right? A lot of these uh, fail at these ethical uh, dilemmas, these ethical questions. For mm. example, we have these really cruel thought experiments uh, of this train, and then having one person on one track and the yeah. like five more people on the other track, right? Yeah. All these, uh, yeah. Very cruel, but I guess much needed because mm-hmm. to sort our ethics or, or our morals, right? So I think a lot of these, first of all, humanity as such, we don't really, we don't have a consensus amongst us on ethics and morals. We are quite, you know, based on our cultural differences. We have very different perspectives and understandings. And translating all this, so first of all, humanity coming to one conclusion, one definition, and then translating this definition you know, trying to mimic this and taking this into the, into the computational space. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a long way ahead. Yeah. It depends ultimately. But personally, given, given a chance, I would, you, I would love to would offload love, my you brain. You would love to crack the code. <laughs> uh, I would, um, cracking the code, I'm not very confident, but I would love to offload my brain. Like, like you know, if I'm yeah. at the end of my life and I'm yeah. dying or before I die, yeah, yeah I would love to get my brain uh, transferred yeah. because I really want to see what this humanity is capable of in like 100 years, 200 years, 500 years. Mm. Are we going to see any extraterrestrials? Are we going to have like, you know, like a galactic commons? Are we going to have uh, spaceships and you know all the sci-fi stuff that you see? Yeah, and that that, really that would be that that would be something that what you're talking about and and you're, that's called the singularity, right? Where you mm-hmm. are able to actually download your stuff and and then live a virtual life after that. So you're basically making yourself immortal uh, in a in in a virtual world, and uh, that's an interesting concept because there have been people who've been uh, propagating it like. For example, Ray Kuzwell, who talks about, he specifically mm. talks about possibility of downloading all his memories and all his information and knowledge into a package where he will then live on forever. Yeah. However, sometimes I'm, it's also a little daunting because having seen too much of uh, too many Black Mirror episodes, <laughs> yeah. I'm also a little scared <laughs> yeah. of who might be controlling my uh, digital brain who who so. might be controlling who or are we are we currently being controlled controlled anywhere because that's the 
that's the other one right about are we living mm. in, a in a simulation simulation yeah. so the simulation theory yeah. comes into it <laughs> but anyway there's so much uh, if we start going down that rabbit hole but no yeah. se- seriously rachna it's been it's been it's been real fun and to all the people listening rachna uh, mm. uh, this is your time what would you like to tell them if there are students listening to you and you said you were inspired when you were in college and there was there were teachers or professors who came to your class and said uh, you know this is what i built or this is what i wanted to do now there are a lot of listeners who are listening to you and being inspired or getting inspired currently uh, the the young kids listening what would your message be to them and how would you address this uh, as far as their careers or their life goals are concerned yeah yeah i'd love to yeah so first of all um I so I, I'd like to be brutally honest, you know, I prefer to be brutally honest and space is a very uh, competitive field. It's definitely not for everybody. You have to be really obsessed and you should never want to do anything else other than space to sustain in space. It's a very, very crazy space. And first of all, the pay is uh, quite low <laughs> it's compared to the other sectors. Space is super cool, but the pay is low. So if you just go to glassdoor and compare the salaries of spacex and google employees you'll know the difference right this is common across the world so but what i personally love being in space is everything is a challenge you know every day you go and solve these amazing engineering problems and everything for example finding new people finding new opportunities everything you need to display your ingenuity and you have to you know it's always uh, i wouldn't call it a struggle i would call it a challenge so if you have the knack for it then space is the place to be it's quite amazing and secondly it's uh, it, it's it's very daunting yes but it's also very welcoming and because the space sector is very small people are very close knit and they are and they're quite often they're very willing to help each other even strangers so you do get a lot of support here uh, because it's very close knit and lastly for uh, given the age group of your uh, podcast uh, of your listeners hokim i'd like to tell them that you don't need to a lot a lot of uh, uh, students have this misconception that you need to have fancy space degrees or you know uh, like these high or phd's or something to get into space but unless you're doing astronomy or you know these uh, theoretical physics or really advanced topics like this if you want to get into space as an engineer or you know similar other roles you don't really need space degrees for example a lot of my colleagues on my team uh, i guess only two of us have like a masters or a bachelor degree related to space everybody else has either a master in computer science or a bachelor in computer science or very all these generic degrees right so you don't really need any fancy degrees and before uh, and also another thing that i see a lot of students doing is um especially indian students a lot of them would like would go on a degree marathon right like they do their bachelors as soon as they graduate they really want to do a masters and then or, or perhaps a phd and they just want to be done with education so this word is something that i hear very often especially from indian students so this i would not really recommend this because like i mentioned earlier it's it's more like a marathon you know space you can't really sprint and you are a student for the rest of your life you have to keep learning so don't try to finish it, everything at the same time because you are taking the risk of being stuck in a master degree or a master program that you absolutely hate with a huge student le- debt looming over your head so try not to jump into it so what i would really my my advice to a lot of um, if you're doing your undergrad of course you need an undergraduate degree uh after you graduate don't try to take up the first master program that catches your fancy try to gain some work experience it need not be in the space industry because of course i understand in india it's very difficult to land a space opportunity with just an undergrad degree but try to work somewhere get some sort of a work experience even remotely related to your area of interest because you would really know if that's what you really want to do and you can always transition in and out of the space industry so that's very much possible right so that's my advice try to get some work experience and space industry mostly works um across the world it works mostly on recommendations personal recommendations and so so building having a network is very important and in the space industry network doesn't just mean 
you know, the number of connections on your LinkedIn profile or uh, it doesn't really mean anything. So having a strong network means you have to form and cultivate personal relationships with people. And this is definitely possible because the size, you know, the, the size of the industry is very small. So try to do, try to participate in events. Don't just attend events, try to organize events, be it a small event at your university or try to be out there in space and try to do these events, participate in events, speak, build these personal rapport or relationships with people, join any network groups that you have around you. And this, you need to do it from when you are a student. It's, it's actually fun. I mean, I've enjoyed it. If you find any part of this um, not so fun, then maybe rethink uh, whether space is really for you. But my bottom line is try only do anything that really excites you. You know, every morning you should be jumping out of your bed and saying, yay, I'm going to do this today. Right. And, and try to find a job where or try to do something or try to mold your livelihood so that the salary seems like a bonus. You know, all the kicks that you get, you should get it on an everyday basis. The salary is just a bonus. So that way, I think life can be quite fun in the space industry. Wow, Rachna, I thought that was really valuable and not just to students. I think I need to take advice as well. <laughs> when you spoke about being a lifelong learner and trying to follow and do what you really enjoy doing. And uh, that's what we try to do here at uh, Indian Genes. We love to have these conversations, especially with people like you. And in some way, if we can put this out there and people listening to us, I always say, even if one person listens to this conversation and, and gets inspired, to take that next step or take another step, then I think we've spent our time really well, besides the fact that we've just really enjoyed speaking to each other. And Rachna, to people listening to you, if you want to, uh, how do they find you or where do they find you? And could you just once again, let us know about your podcast and where they can listen to that? Yeah. So uh, first of all, Hokim, you were so I'm a huge fan of Indian genes. I was going through all these episodes and I absolutely love the research that you put into it. And I, I have a lot to learn from my episode as well, from, from my podcast as well, from the way you do Indian genes. So <laughs> you're quite awesome. And I also super duper loved uh, having this conversation. I was a little hesitant in the beginning because I had no clue what I was going to talk about. But then you are such a brilliant host. I mean, that's a job, right? That's the job of the host to, to uh, just get I, the conversation I'm not used going. To, I'm not used to compliments, Rashna, and I'm really happy that <laughs> this is not a video because you would see me blushing. So I, I'm like <laughs> wriggling in my seat now. So we got to get past this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Maybe I can I can treat you to something where we meet. Maybe we can celebrate in person sometime, no, will, and I can will. make you blush a little more no, in person. Will. This is this is this is something that I, that I don't know how to deal with. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Uh, I kind of also shut off. But um, yeah, and coming to the second, uh, yeah, so regarding my podcast, so it's called, like I said, uh, it's called Those Space People. And it's available on all podcasting platforms like Spotify, CastBox, Google, Apple Podcasts, everywhere. Maybe uh, you can include a link to my page or the, okay. the podcast in the description if you want but i'm happy to be uh so i'm quite active on linkedin so uh maybe you can also give a link to it but my full name is rachna reddy mamiti and with a few keywords like berlin and bst or something i think you should be your listeners should be able to find me so linkedin would be great uh or even on my website there's also my personal email id some people also reach out to me on that and i also have a twitter account uh which I don't check super often. So I think LinkedIn would be great. Mm. And uh, before we let you go again, we keep saying let you go, but hold you back. <laughs> you are very involved in women in aerospace, right? And would you want to just tell us a little bit about what you're doing there? Yeah, definitely. So Women in Aerospace is this international network and uh, it has a lot of local groups. Uh, across the world. So I, me and uh, a couple of my other friends, we started this local group under the ambit of uh, Women Aerospace, VIA, in, in Berlin. So yeah, so as a co-lead, I guess, is my position. So yeah, we, we try to organize these. It's more of a networking group. You know, we try to organize these um, events and meetups. So now ESA is actually running these um, interviews. So it's selecting an astronaut candidates. 
And so we are having a short moderated uh, discussion. So we have a space archaeologist, mm -hmm. you know, and we have a few um, applicants of this ESA program, of the ESA astronaut candidate program, mm -hmm. and also an analog astronaut. So we are trying to have a conversation between all these women who are connected to different parts of the space flight, you know, honoring Valentina Tereshkova. And, but like I said, it's more of a networking group. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Actually, one of the local groups also runs a book club. And we also try to read books from non mainstream authors related to space. Uh, because a lot of uh, content, you know, in the world is dominated by American authors, American male authors. So we try to bring read like diverse uh, voices to it. Hmm. And yeah, it's, it's more like and there are some um, scholarships and uh, grants and programs available. Actually, it would be great if um, anyone would like to start a Women in Aerospace India chapter because there's nothing in India. So hmm, maybe it's time to start something in India. Yeah, that's but a, that's it's, a great, it's also uh, yeah, that's a great uh, thought, uh, Rachna. Yeah, and uh, so men are also really welcome. So I'm first of all, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, uh, you know, these gender, any kind of differentiation, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, grouping people, you know, segregating people into groups. But however, it's uh, so men are also super welcome. So we are women in aerospace is very welcome to men. But then we try to bring as many women voices as possible, because uh, there's there are very few uh, women in space, actually. And because we I strongly believe that diversity is the way to go you know we need to have a lot of diverse uh, voices in shaping the in shaping the future because the more people the more diverse the minds are which are taking these tech decisions the better the world is going to be tomorrow i don't know if you've heard about space hero but it's a particular uh, reality show that's coming up within the next couple of years and they're going to be selecting about 12 candidates or 24 candidates from all over the world. Those people are then going to be trained by uh, a special team of ex-astronauts from NASA. And the winner of that is going to get a trip to the International Space Station somewhere in 2020, uh, 2023. I think that's another great initiative because, you know, building up this enthusiasm and interest around space, not only for people who are technically inclined but for just people who are aspirational and see that as a dream or something that they they would want to do one day so there's so much of it coming up together now and i think that's interesting as well wow i've never i just googled it wow this seems so cool i've never yeah. heard of it thanks and, for telling uh, me about Rachana, it. We, uh, indian jeans is actually uh we are ambassadors for the space hero program we did our previous episode with the two uh, co-founders Deborah and Thomas. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've seen this. No, I've seen it on your playlist, yeah. but I haven't heard and it yet. Oh. Yeah, so that's quite interesting. Uh, we were quite happy to be part of that. Oh, we are very happy to be part of that because that sounds so exciting. Oh, these guys are then, are they working with Axiom Space as well? Correct. They're working with Axiom Space as well. Oh, okay. That's awesome. Wow. I, I, I'm definitely, I'm going to check this episode out today. Yeah, that was, <laughs> so that cool. was fun as well. And again, Rachna, uh, thank you so much for your time. It was fun. I'm looking at my ticker here now, the clock at the moment, and wow, we've really, <laughs> we've really overshot the runway. But I'm sure we enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I'm sure you did. And people listening to us would pick up from that energy and decide what they're going to do with their space journey. We've given them a lot of avenues, or hopefully you know, kindle their minds in new directions as well, Rachna. <laughs> yeah, I've absolutely enjoyed this. I didn't realize, wow, it's been two hours, but this is the perfect way for me. It's Saturday morning, so I'm all geared up for my weekend. So thanks for this amazing uh, morning boost <laughs> for my weekend. Uh, absolutely loved it. And your listeners can also feel free to reach me out on LinkedIn or other places. And had a lovely uh, conversation. Thank you very much, Joachim. Thank you so much once again from Indian Jeans. This Hub Hopper original ko sunne ke liye aapka shukriya. Agar aap bhi apna podcast launch karna chahte hain, to Hub Hopper Studio website pe register kare aur ek minute ke andar andar apna khud ka podcast launch kare. 
यही नहीं स्टूडियो देता है आपको पूरी आजादी कहीं भी कभी भी अपना पॉडकास्ट लॉन्च करने की सिर्फ तीन आसान स्टेप्स में तो साथ में अपना पॉडकास्ट शुरू करने के लिए तैयार जस्ट हॉप ऑन हब हॉपर सिंपली कॉन्टेंट